Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. This week, we're in Truma. We are in the portion where we're now learning what the tabernacle is supposed to look like. We read throughout the Torah, especially this parts right here, that uh, these are instructions that were given to Moshe, that the people of Israel were to follow without any mistakes. And that's a pretty big task. But there were people put in charge by the spirit of Yahweh, by the Ruach Elohim, to make sure everything was done exactly according to as it was shown. There is a plan for what Yahweh was doing in the midst of his people. And uh, we're, we're going to show some of that today. And, and this plan, this imagery is prophetic and revealing to us about what the Father wants to do in you as well. You know, we're going to talk about the tabernacle, right? Right. The word is Mishkan, and this is a word that we use for tabernacle from the word Shekhan, which means to dwell, but also Mikdash, which is a sanctuary, a holy place. So we're going to see some things in here today is like, is it important to have a holy place for Yahweh to dwell? Yes, absolutely. And uh, a lot of people, when we get to these portions where we start talking about the tabernacle, say, well, don't you know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You know what? I, I would agree with that. Okay. First off, without any doubt, yes, I, I would agree with that. But does that negate the fact that there was a tabernacle in the midst of them and that Yahweh had a place where all Israel was supposed to come together, especially in the Shalosh Regalim, the three festivals that they were supposed to appear where he established the, the uh, tabernacle and temple when it stood for them to come and to worship him, to be a part of a people called Israel. See, the tabernacle was a central focus, focus for Israel. This was a point of knowing that, the, that Yahweh was with his people. But as well, it was a sense of, okay, but I want you to carry my presence with you wherever you go. So it's the combination of these two things. Plus, we get into things like, how can you say, well, you're a temple for the Ruach to dwell, you're a temple for his presence, if we don't understand what the tabernacle and the temple looked like, how it functioned, what was its purpose, what were the things that were going on. So we do have some roles to study in there. We first have to learn what was established before we start making up metaphors and, and other issues for it, right? Okay. So we're going to get into a few things in here today. First, there's some keynotes that we need to look at. So we're in Truma. Truma is an offering. Truma is something that is lifted up before Yahweh, not necessarily uh, a sacrifice or an off a sacrifice that's put on the altar is what I mean. Uh, there were other things that were given here as Truma, something that was dedicated, set apart to Yahweh, which we'll break that down here very shortly. Okay. But first off, who was to give to the building of the tabernacle? And you would say, well, Israel, of course you would be right. But some would say every single person in Israel gave. Now, while I believe that every single person among Israel had a role to play in the tabernacle being among them, there were certain key people that were to make sure it functioned correctly, that it was set up properly, that the area was kept holy and undefiled. There were different people with different responsibilities. And when they were building it, there were things that they needed as well. So did all Israel give to the building of the tabernacle to have it in their midst. Of course, this is something that would benefit all Israel, but did they all come to the place of uh, making sure it was in their midst? And this is some things that we get into today. All right. So let's start off. Let's go uh, Exodus 25, one and two. Adonai spoke to Moshe saying, tell B'nai Israel, tell the people of Israel, the sons of Israel to take up an offering for me. Look at this from anyone whose heart compels him. You are to take my offering. So this bodes a question. How do you give to Yahweh? I mean, it's not like he's physically right here in front of us that we can say, I want you to use this for your kingdom, right? There's not a, a specific way to do this, is there? Well, how do we give to Yahweh? And the idea here is everything that Yahweh has given us, we give to him. Everything that Yahweh has given within us, for us, uh, everything he's given us, the ability to work, the ability to live our lives, the ability to provide for our households and to provide for this, to have a, a means in the community, we give back to him. So these are some things that we look at, right? So we give of ourselves for whatever is needed to show that Elohim is here among us here now day by day. Okay. And uh, this is not something everyone is willing to do. It's just facing the facts, right? Not everyone sees this as important. No, I want to go do my own thing. I want to just uh, be apart from the community. I don't want to have any connection or relation with anyone else. And, and uh, I mean, there's a difference between if it's just not available to you where you live, but 
it's also a, a different understanding of do you desire it? Uh, this is, again, one of the key connecting points why Yahweh wanted the people to go to Jerusalem. We're not in that portion of Scripture today, but this is what this is what he wanted us to keep in mind, that we are connected to him, but we are a part of a people. So how do we give to Yahweh? How do we do this? Well, it starts off when he says, to give to me. We read from Samson Raphael Hirsch in the Pentateuch, it says, nothing is to be given directly to God, but the gifts of each individual are to be given to the community for divine purposes. You see that? This implies that it is not the individual, but the community who has to erect the institutions for God's purposes. And it is not for single givers, just individuals, but for the community that these arrangements have to be established, right? So these are some things that we look at today. When we're giving to the means of, of having a, a, a place for Yahweh to dwell among us, again, yes, it needs to be us in our lives day by day, but there is an important role in coming together with other people like-minded to worship, to edify one another, to help build each other up, and to, and to not lose connection with your purpose here, okay? So we have Taruma, what you lift up, and what we learn is that when you lift up and dedicate something to Yahweh, yes, it's given for holy purposes, it's given for divine things, but as well, in the process of giving, you enable that to be in your midst. So by giving to the divine things, you're making sure these divine things are among you. You benefit from that. So in turn, you give to elevate the presence of Yah in, around you, but by, the, but by the presence of Yah being around you, you also are lifted up yourself. See that? Uh, makes me think of Yeshua. It says, "Give it will be given to you." Now, I'm not just talking about money, guys. Normally, it's at this point where either people either turn off the video or or uh, 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 pull up other things that I'm not saying. Okay, what I am saying is that means everything. Okay, yeah, it in, it includes uh, money, offerings, things like that. But I'm talking every aspect of your life, everything, because when Yeshua said, "Give it will be given to you," it was in regards to everything that you give everything that you do will be returned to you. You know, uh, you help someone out, you'll get help back. You speak evil of someone, that's gonna be returned to you as well. You bless someone, that's gonna be returned to you as well. Every aspect of our lives follows this principle. Okay, you give to holy things, and then the holy things are being around you, you, you reap benefits of that, you have blessing for that, okay? These are some of the things we're talking about. So truma, the word truma is from the word rum means to be raised above something, hence lifted up out of something, to be separated for a higher purpose. It's related to the to this to this word uh, nadav, which is uh, also related to nataf. Okay, but we're talking about etymology here. Okay, so these are re related words. It means to flow out or to to flow from within, uh, to incite, to make a gift. It means something that is complete free will. It's something you're not coerced, uh, you're you're not urged. It's just the need is there. It's put there. It's spoken. This is what you need. And uh, do you feel that worthy to have in your midst? Then the people gave to it, right? So again, we're talking the etymology of the word teruma is not just a contribution, but something that is raised. Jonathan Sachs puts it this way. When we give, it's not just, to, it's not just our contribution, but we who are raised up. We survive by what we are given, but we achieve dignity by what we give. What do we feel is important to us is where we focus our time, our efforts, our energy, uh, everything in our life, right? So we give to what we feel is important of whatever we can to make sure this is around us. So when we're told in the scripture to give, but to receive the truma from whoever heart compels him, whoever is compelled to do so, right? Not coerced to do so, compelled to do so. So the question is, are we willing without any coercion, to give to the needs of the kingdom of Yahweh when it is put before us. We find some things like Proverbs 22, 9, where it says, Blessed are those who are generous. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each should give according to what he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 3 John 1, 5 and 6 says, Dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the, the assemblies here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. See, so it's a matter of what we are giving to, to make sure that the, the work of the kingdom continues in our midst, in our lives personally, but as well as an outreach of those beyond us who may help in ways we, we never can, right? So the question here is, are we willing? Well, the question from back then was, were all of them willing? Let's take a look at it. Exodus 35, we will go forward a little bit. Exodus 35, verse 4. 
Moses says to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that Yahweh has commanded. Again, what we have, uh, the, the, the plan was given, and then we see Moshe going and reiterating it to the people, right? So this is what we have here, verse 5. Take from among you a contribution to Yahweh, whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring Yahweh's contribution. Then he goes through and he lists some of the things that are needed, right? But then what happens? Exodus 35, 20. So all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. So they all went back to their tents. They all went uh, uh, back to their dwelling places. They probably talked it over with one another. So well, what are you, what are you thinking? This is what I'm thinking. What are you thinking? How, and and do, what do you want to do here? Right? So what happens next? Okay. We see in the, in the next verse 21 and they came. So the question is, who are they? It doesn't say, and all the congregation came back. It says all the congregation was there. They heard, they knew what was, what, what the need was. And then they all left. And then they came. They are the people whose heart stirred them to have this accomplished and set in their midst. Those who saw it as important, they made sure it was there. Okay. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him. And they brought Yahweh's contribution to be, to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. So they came both men and women, all who were of a willing heart. And the list goes through and lists things that they brought that were uh, dedicated to Yahweh. Okay. Again, this is an issue of we do what we feel is important. Okay. Uh, if we don't feel something's important, we'll put it off, won't we? No, this is something that they felt was important to have in their midst. Here we are, we're at the mountain. We're going to move from this mountain eventually, right? So here, so what's going to happen? Is Yahweh going to stay here on the mountain? No, Yahweh says, I want you to, go, I'm going with you and I am holy. I want you to build a holy place for me to dwell, even though he went with the people as a whole, but he went here in the midst of them and a holy place that was set up as a reminder for them. He was with them, right? Exodus 25, three. So the need was given, the people gave again, notice the people did not put stipulations on it where they say, you know, I will give only if they was said, this is, this, this is what we need for the work that's, that's going to be among you. And the people came and they gave, right? And again, we have the list here as you go on, you see the different things that they're going to need. Now, this is something to keep in mind as well for the work of the tabernacle and for the Levites and the Kohenim, right? They had to have their roles fulfilled within the Mishkan and the temple when it stood. They had roles that were there, and that was their duty in life. That was their responsibilities to minister to Yahweh and to minister to the people. And this was, this was what they were. So the people had to take care of them and the service and the work that was in it and make sure that it had what it needed for its daily functioning right? Uh, here's an example. There was a Tamid that was given, you know, every morning, every evening, there was a Tamid that was put on the altar. If the people didn't provide that, there wasn't a Tamid. See? So again, these are things that the people had a direct role in it, not just in establishing it in their midst, but in its continued function among them. Okay. So let's keep going. Exodus 25, eight. So have them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. You are to make it all precisely, look at that, precisely according to everything that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle, the pattern of all its furnishings within, just so you must make it. So first off, we're going to take a quick look at this. It says, prepare a sanctuary for me. Sanctuary, mikdash, is a, a holy place, a place that is set apart. And, and again, you have people, well, don't you know we're all holy and we all lead holy lives? Yeah, that's true. Um, we shouldn't live this life where we say the holy and the profane, you know, on Shabbat, we're holy, but the rest of the week, we're not holy. No, that, that's, that's not the way we do it. We are a holy people all week long. No matter where we are, no matter where we live, we are set apart to be a holy people. And we are to carry the holy presence of Yahweh with us. Okay. But again, Yahweh said, I want you to establish a holy place for me. All right. So again, do, do we need to prepare a sanctuary and how important is it to prepare a place for Yahweh to dwell with us? And he says, do this so that I may dwell among them. Okay. I'm going to show you later what he, what he literally means here by among literally means within uh, the idea is we want Yahweh to go with us wherever we are, and he wants to dwell within you, not just beside you, okay? And that's what he says he's going to do. Let's look at Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 
Uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, Thus says Adonai, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is the house that you would build for me? Where is the place of my rest? For my hand has made all these things. So all these things came to be, declares Adonai. But on this one will I look, one humble of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. See, yeah, it's true. Yahweh dwells with his people. But he also established points of contact, if you if you will, uh, where we are to meet and to worship. But wherever we go, we are to carry his presence with us. Okay, so he says, I want to dwell within you. I want to be with you, but I want these these places here for for you to come together and for the nations to see. There is a holy place. Everything that he does for you, it's not just for you. It's for you. It's for him. And it's for other people to see as well. Right. Let's look, let's flash forward to Deuteronomy for a moment. Devarim. Chapter 12 says, you are to seek only the place Adonai your God chooses from all your tribes to put his name there. There you will come. There you will bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the offering of your hand, your vow and free will offerings, and the firstborn of the herd of your flock. There you and your households will eat before Adonai your God and rejoice in every undertaking of your hand as Adonai your God has blessed you. Verse 8. You will not do all the things as we are doing here today, everyone doing what is right in his own eyes. That's a big problem, isn't it? Uh, for you have not yet come to the resting place, the inheritance that Adonai your God is giving you. But when you cross the Yardin and settle in the land that Adonai your God enables you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around you, you will dwell in safety. Verse 11. Then the place Adonai your God chooses to make his name dwell, there you are to bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the offering of your hand, all your finest vow offerings that you vow to Adonai, then you will rejoice before Adonai your God, you, your sons, your daughters, your slaves and maids, and the Levite in your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. So he says, you're going to come there and there you're going to bring all these offerings. I will receive them in this place. I don't want you just making any an altar anywhere, making sacrifices or offerings just anywhere you want to. Okay, he says, in the place where I have established my name, there you do it. Because he doesn't want anybody mistaking what you're doing as something that's being sacrificed to an idol, something that's being sacrificed like the pagans do it. Right. That's why he tells Israel, you can slaughter the meat, just bury the blood and you can eat it. But he says, if you're going to make an offering, you need to do that at the place where I have established my presence. OK, again, it's a, it's a it's a mode of conduct. It's how we live. It's how the world perceives the God that we serve is a big part of this. Right. Exodus 20, verse 24. It says, you were to make an altar of earth for me, and there you will sacrifice your burnt offerings, your fellowship offerings, your sheep and your cattle. In every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. See that? So again, he gives, uh, this is how I want you to do it. He establishes not just a physical place, but how it is to be handled and the attitude towards it as well. Once all these things are established, you'll notice they're blessed and they are called holy. Some of these things are called most holy. You know, we, we're talking about, you know, the Holy of Holies, right? It's as in just this one little square inside the tent. No, it's, if, you, if you read through the scriptures, there are many things that's, that are called most holy. Okay, it is that, that square where the ark resided is most holy, but the altar was also called most holy, right? So again, there's other things that are given here that if we don't take a good look into it, we're not going to understand. And Yahweh says all of these things are set apart to glorify him for his purposes, and it is our role to, to be established in that and, uh, and to come to him as he instructs. So he says, you are to make it all precisely according to everything that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furnishings within, just so you must make it. So he says, I'm giving you a pattern. He got a blueprint. I, I, I don't believe this. This is just Yahweh just telling Moshe, this is what I want you to do. Because guys, if you start describing things to people and have them draw it, you're going to come up with a lot of different drawings and everyone's going to have their own idea of what it's going to look like. And it's called artistic interpretation, right? But this is not what was given. See, I believe that Yahweh showed Moshe that the tabernacle, the, the sanctuary, the um, Mikdash in the, in the heavens where he dwelled like an Isaiah six kind of moment. Right. And said, look, do you see this? Here's, here's a lampstand. This is how you're going to make it. See how it is. See how it's, you know, the, the almond branches and the bulbs. And, and then uh, it takes them over to the table with showbread. This is what it looks like. So he says, make sure that everything is made according as I have shown you. And the people made it as Moses told them, then brought it to Moses afterwards to make sure that this was as Moses saw it. 
So there could not be any artistic interpretation here. This isn't be like, well, this is the way you said Moses, but that doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to do it this way because don't you know it'd be more practical if it would look like this. It was not your place. Okay. It was the place to make it as it was given to Moses. And we see some of this in Hebrews 8, 8, 5. It says they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, right? So it says the things we have here are shadows and copies. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. He showed Moshe things on the mountain, not just explained them, not just spoke. He showed them to him. And uh, he was to take this and then take this blueprint, if you will, and give it to the people and the people were to make it. Same thing when David passed it on to Solomon, right? David wanted to build a house for Yahweh. Yahweh says, you're a warrior. You got a lot of blood on your hands. There needs to be a man of peace to build my sanctuary. It's honorable that David wanted to do this. And, and God gave David the plans, but Solomon was the one to build it, right? Let's look at this. First Chronicles 28. 10 through 19, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to read the whole thing, but 10 through 19 is what we're looking at. It says, be careful now for Yahweh has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Look at verse 11. David gave Solomon, his son, the plan. Look at verse 12. He gave him the plan that he had in mind for the courts. He get he, all these things. There was a plan for these things. Even verse 13, the divisions of the priests and the work of the service, not just how things were supposed to look and, and the measurements, but how they were to function and how to divide up the people so, to, so they had their roles in order. You know, the divisions of the priesthood. We have all these priests. How do we pick who serves what, when, where, how? Right. All of these things God gave to David and, and David gave to, to Solomon and Solomon is the one to help institute it, put it back in there. Uh, verse 16, going on, continuing the weight of the gold. Verse 17, uh, the gold for the forks, the basins, the cups, the altar, the altar of incense, all of these things. Right. Now look at verse 19. All of this he made clear to me in writing from the hand of Yahweh, all the work to be done according to the plan. All of this he got from the hand of Yahweh, according to the plan. And as this plan he gave to Solomon and then Solomon did it. Solomon built it. Solomon instituted it. Okay. So what are the things we're looking at now? What I want to establish to you is that this temple tabernacle and everything like it is we see in many places in scripture. Okay. This model of the tabernacle is, uh, is a model for the presence of Yahweh anyway, even in you. Okay. Uh, we are body, soul, spirit, a tripart being, right? We are body, soul, spirit. And even within that, he dwells in you in spirit in the midst of you. They, they started building at the very innermost part. They started with the ark and that represents your heart, right? They started within you give them that first. That's the first thing that's made for the, for the presence of Yahweh, your heart. And then everything was built from the inside out. And then it was assembled. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. So he says, make it after the pattern I show you. Even back in the garden, there's symbolism and a pattern in places where we see that Yahweh will dwell. In every place, the tabernacle in the heavens was a model for the others. In the garden, we have he created Eden. Then there was Gan Eden. The, there was a garden in, in Eden, eastward. And then eastward, he planted the garden, right? It was opening to the east, just like the tabernacle, opening in the east. Then in the midst of the garden, he had the tree right? The tree of life was there in the midst of the garden. So again, this is a, a three part structure, three main parts that we're looking here. What about on the mountain, Mount Sinai itself? This still follows this model. We have Israel all around at the base, but then there was a point where only those that were invited could come up past that point. And then once you get further in, there was only a point where Moses was allowed, right? So again, we have a picture of like the courtyard and then uh, the holy place and the most holy place. Okay. And, and again, we see this over and over and again in multiple places. Um, what about the Mishkan? This is what we're looking at in the Mishkan. Okay. So again, you have the picture here, you have uh, the courtyards, then you have the, the, the outer court, you have the holy place and the most holy place, right? In the temple, you see the same kind of thing. There's a courtyard and then there's a holy place and a most holy place, right? Got a picture here of Solomon's temple and Herod's temple. Again, we, we have the, that picture there. There's a, there's a court, then there's, a, a, as you go in, there's a holy place, and then there is a most holy place. Okay, so what we learn is that the tabernacle was a tripartite structure. 
The outer section of the courtyard we see in uh, chapter 27, verse 9. The intersection of the holy place we see in 2633. The most holy place, again, 2633. Um, the holy space was with a progression toward the most holy. The closer you approached, the more aware you were to be of the responsibility of the holy things. The, the closer you got in there, there was a requirement for you to be holy, clean, and, and there are certain ways you had to do things. You couldn't just approach however you wanted. You couldn't walk in there through the gate and bypass the altar, bypass the basin where you're supposed to wash, bypass the altar, uh, bypass the altar of incense, bypass the, 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 the menorah, bypass the table of showbread, and march right into the most holy place. You would die. Okay. Further, you had to go in in one direction. There's only one way you could go in. You couldn't tunnel under and try to dig into the most holy place or drop in from, from above. Didn't work. There's only one way you were going in. And the closer you got to the presence of Yahweh, the more you had to be, uh, realize the holy things and understand your role and, and how to approach. Okay. That's why those who were established in there, the Levi'im, the Kohanim, they were established in what they were taught and instructed specifically on how they were to do their responsibilities and to guard that as well. Okay. So again, while the Mishkan is real, there is also much symbolism that is involved in it. We find in the uh, Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, he says, in fact, there is sufficient reason to suggest that the tabernacle contained much symbolism that relates to the divine garden, the, the Garden of Eden. This type of connection has been observed between the temple in Jerusalem and the Garden of Eden, but it also applies to the tabernacle. As we, we continue, the Genesis narrative describes the Garden of Eden as being entered from the east, as was the tabernacle. The cherubim were stationed to guard access to the garden as cherubim were erected in the tabernacle to protect the presence of Yahweh. Adam in the Genesis story was placed in the garden to work it and take care of it. The combination of these verbs occurs again in the Pentateuch only with reference to the duties of the Levites who took care of the tabernacle. The lampstand as a tree of life fits within this garden symbolism as well. And we see again in Hebrews 9, uh, verse 22, where it says, With blood, almost all things are purified according to the Torah. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Um, we, we touched on this before, where this is also implying jub the Jubilee years as well. It says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, or this relates to the Hebrew word Yovel. So we're talking about a Jubilee and a uh, forgiveness of debts and a uh, returning back to your inheritance. There's a lot there. I'm not getting into all that today, though. Uh, verse 23. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the things, see, the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For the Messiah did not enter with a sanctuary made with human hands, but a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. See that? So what Yahweh is since is establishing, you know, Adam was made in the present in the image of Yahweh and the things that Yahweh had done, he kind of gave Adam to do as well, like rule over the earth, right? Have dominion over, do all these things. And there are many things that he wants us to do one to remind us of who he is and what he has done. And we have some of that purpose here on the earth to establish that. And we can see some of these similarities as well. Example in the universe in Genesis. God made the sky. He made the two large lights. He made the beasts of the earth. He saw all that he made, and behold, it was good. The heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. And God completed all the work that he had done, and God blessed it, and he sanctified it. In regards to the Mishkan, we see it says, They shall make me a sanctuary. They shall make me an ark, make the table. Moses saw the skilled work, and behold, all they had done. As God had commanded, they had done it. All the work of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting was completed. Moses completed the work, and Moses blessed it. And you shall sanctify it and all its vessels. Again, we have a combination of these two. In essence, what we're doing is as the tabernacle is being built, we are literally building on earth what is in heaven. Don't, haven't we prayed this before? You know, on earth as it is in heaven, right? Um, that should be something for us to keep our focus. You know, every day we are to build on earth what Yahweh established in the heavens. Build it around us and within us. We have a role to do that. And in that, we need to study. We need to study. If we are holy people, we need to know what does that mean? What do a holy people, what do they act like? What do they do? And again, ultimately you could say, all, always pointing towards the presence of Yahweh and pointing towards his kingdom. But how do we do that? And that's where the Torah comes in. It instructs us how to walk in his righteousness, how to walk in his word, his ways. And as we do the things that he has said for us, he dwells with us. Okay. 
So the body of Messiah is referred to as a temple for Yahweh. What better way for, for Yahweh to dwell among men than to dwell within them? And this is what we see in 2 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17, where it says, what, are, what agreement can there be between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will house myself in them. And I will walk among you, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, Adonai says, go out from their midst, separate yourselves, don't touch what is unclean, then I myself will receive you. See that? As a holy people, you have responsibility to walk as a holy people. Okay? And he says, I will house myself in them. Where did he say I will house myself in them? I thought it was just a matter of I will walk among them. Well, there's a few places, one of which we find in Leviticus. In Leviticus, we find uh, uh, chapter 26, verses 11 and 12. It says, I will put my tabernacle among you, and I will not reject you, but I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. Now look at this, where he says, I will put my tabernacle among you. It's mishkani, that's my tabernacle, betochechem, betochechem. This word betochechem is from the Hebrew word tavek, is the root word there, and it means literally to be in the very center of, not just build me a house next to yours. No, it means I will dwell in the very center of you. By having the model of the tabernacle within the center of the camp, it's a representation that Yahweh wants to dwell in the very center of you and be your God, to dwell within your heart, to dwell within your spirit. He's dwelling within you by you making sure you have within your heart established a place for him to dwell. See that? Okay, so that's the question, isn't it? Are we preparing a place for Yahweh to, to dwell? This could be physically. This can be within ourselves. Are we preparing our hearts for gathering together with one another? We meet for Shabbat. We meet for the Moedim. We meet for uh, the, the festivals. We meet for all of these things. Are we preparing ourselves for that? Or are we just going through the motions? Or are we actually saying, I am doing this as a holy thing. I am honoring Shabbat as a holy thing. I am going to meet with my king. I'm going to meet with my Redeemer, and it is a holy thing. He is a holy God, and he has called me as a holy person, and we are gathering together in this time. See that? So the question is, what are you building and who are you building for, right? So what is our attitude concerning the task at hand? And we are told, work wholeheartedly. Do we dread the time that's spent in service, or do we work with a giving, willing heart? Consider this. He, he had the people in Mitzrayim, and they were uh, building for Pharaoh. And Yahweh frees them. He redeems them. He brings them out. And they're like, yes. And he brings them to the mountain. He gives them the Torah. He reveals himself to them, shows them his heart, and says, now I want you to have a building project for me. Can you imagine? Wait a minute. We just did this. Uh, and and there, I'm sure there are some among them that said, wait a minute. We just came out of uh, building for somebody else. What makes you think I want to build for you? And it was all about relationship, isn't it? See, it's different when it is the one who has redeemed you who says, I want you to work for me. See, because that is being kingdom-minded, freedom-minded, setting the captives free, learning there is a better way, and showing that to others around us as well. So when we dwell in unity, we are preparing a place for Yahweh to dwell. We see in Isaiah 57, and it shall be said, build up. Build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who was high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. And also, look at that, not just, not instead, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. See that? This wasn't an either or thing. This was a, because you are my people, because you are redeemed, because I want to dwell and live in the midst of you, I want you to prepare a place that you can see and that the world can see. And we're learning to do this together, learning to come together as a people of Yahweh, lift up the name of our God, lift up the name of our Elohim, and lift up our Redeemer, Yeshua, right? Ephesians 3.17 says that through faith, Messiah may dwell in your hearts, having been rooted and founded in love. And that's what we're looking at. Because he has called us and drawn us in with him and we are in his presence, that affects how we live. Because of what he's done for you, has that been important to you? Do you take it for granted? See, because of what he's done for you, you should want that for others. Because he set you free, you should want freedom for others as well. We need to help to be kingdom-minded 
and uh, to help to help one another in this, in a place of unity, a place of dwelling together, and a place of learning to serve the Most High in our midst by helping out one another too. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to be given here. I pray that uh, in, in these notes that we've given here, I hope that there's some things there to kind of uh, uh, shoot forth for your own study, for your own edification, for your own time, more stuff that you can share as well, right? So I do hope this has been an encouragement to you. I do hope this has been a challenge for you as well. And I hope that it blesses you, okay? Uh, if this has been a blessing to you, would you consider making a donation to help us and enable us to continue doing these videos and making these and help putting them out there as well? Uh, share them. If you, if you like what you're hearing, if it is a blessing to you, then share them with, with uh, people that you know. Share them, whatever kind of social media that you use or uh, text links or whatever. How, however it, Yahweh puts it on your heart, share them so that they can be a blessing to others as well, okay? So uh, until next time, I pray that you are blessed and uh, that you be a blessing to others around you and just live the life that he's called us to live, okay? So be blessed and shalom.